писать какой-то ответный а, ответ. И я говорю, что мы всегда с новым идеальным совершенным образом а, писал такие статьи, отстаивая а, сестру послушной из нашего группы. And similarly, when we were publishing, editing and publishing Shula Guru Dave's books, like Journey of the Soul and uh, Gopiki, he helped tremendously with that as well. Just three weeks ago, he helped clarify a very, very important Siddhantic understanding. Sometimes there's an apparent contradiction between acharyas, but not really a contradiction. There's only a lack in our perceiving both acharyas. So it appeared that Srila Gurudev said we were ready to remember the pastimes of uh, Radha and Krishna while chanting, whereas Srila Bhakti Vinyambharati Maharaj said just concentrate on the name. So when I first arrived in Vrindavan, I was visited by the uh, husband and wife webmaster of Srila Bharti Maharaj's website. Who um, asked me about that apparent contradiction because they love them both. And I can only give incomplete and unclear replies. So when they told me they got so much clarification from Prem Priyogena Prabhu, I thought, well, I know where he is. He's in my hometown of Alachua. I know exactly what he's doing now. And I know the right people in Alachua who can connect me. So I immediately called him, and even though he was so jet lagged from flying all over the planet, he had just given a long class in the lecture in the evening. Did you hear what he said? <laughs> And interesting, this, this is the husband and wife. Oh, I was just talking about this webinar. just came in. The manga and Amarish Prabhu. So even though he was jet lagged, tired, and had just given a whole class, he gave me a uh, very long explanation to further and completely clarify the reconciliation that there's no contradiction. And then despite his traveling and the busy schedule, he sent me quotes from Chula Gurde to give further evidence. And now, whenever I go to Chula Gurde, like in his sound files on my iPad, 
I'm hearing it again and again, the same thing, which I had not heard for 25 years. I remember on many occasions when Srila Gurudev would say things like, I'm giving you the shovel to dig deeply into Srila Prabhupada's books. I'm giving you the torchlight with which you can see more clearly Srila Prabhupada's books. Prabhupada's books are like a treasure chest and it was open for the world to get all those jewels. But inside that treasure chest is another smaller treasure chest. Which has still more valuable jewels. And which is locked. And the key to that is in the hands of another Mahabhava. So by Srila Gurudev's mercy, I was able to get a much clearer picture on Srila Gurudev, Srila Prabhupada's books, and words, and lectures, and so on. <laughs> and Graham Priyogena Prabhu helped me now to understand Srila Gurudev better. So now we're going on to the topic at hand, which is my experiences with Srila Prabhupada and Srila Gurudev in relation to their training in art and the significance of the art. Regarding the previous thing that I was talking about? Yeah, I can do it very, very short. I can do it very, very short. <laughs> because it's, it's something that Labanda, Dini, and Navarish Prabhu and I came to. So I actually can already encapsulate it. Once I was very ill in 1969, and I wrote to Prabhupada because he told me stop all your activities and just increase your chanting. So I was chanting all day, 100 rounds of uh, pulling thread. So I asked him, all right, so I'm doing so much now, what should I think about? Should I think about Krishna's pastimes that I'm reading in the Krishna book or your instructions or what? And he, and he wrote back, just concentrate on the sound of the name and everything else will be revealed. Pastimes, form, quality, and everything. And he often wrote us, just chant and hear and Krishna will bless you. So, because our minds were always going on to foreign things, matter, Srila Gurudev was trying to encourage us that better than 
going to what Shula Bharati Maharaj calls the five tape recorders that start playing as soon as we start chanting in the morning. Sound, sight, touch, and so on. Think of the pastimes of the different holy places in Vrindavan. Think about what you've read. Think about your lapis manjali prayers and so many things like that while you're chanting. And then um, I was just hearing a, a darshan yesterday. Gurde was in France, your country, and uh, the devotee was asking, What should I think about? Same question that I had asked for the problem. So Gurudev said, just here and everything else will come. The Guru will say to the, to the very young disciple, just like a teacher will say to the young student, oh, you made A, very good. You're a student, you're studying. And then as soon as he asks him to make B, the student starts crying. So Gurudev said, so the Guru will say to the disciple, the young student, uh, oh, you're chanting and remembering so nicely, just continue. Whereas actually there's no remembrance. But gradually, by following the process and chanting properly, then the remembrance will come. So the French devotee asked, well, what do you mean then when you say chant and remember? So Gurde said, you say, oh, Hari Nam, please help me, I'm so worthless. And then at some point when Nam touches the tongue, a tongue Sri Krishna Namadi, when you reach that high level, automatically remembrance will come. So it all fit in beautifully. So now we'll go on to the topic of Because what happened is, Prayer Priyodhan was the last way to speak this morning. And I said, it's ridiculous because they can get so much more clarity and knowledge and enlightenment by hearing the same topics from you. So, uh, if you could give me a topic that only I can speak about better than you, or as good as you, then I'll go. So he said, speak about your experiences with Prabhupada and Gurde and Because I can't speak about that. Yes, Okay, so I met Prabhupada in 1966 at Tompkins Square Park in New York City in America. 
square body is just a and I immediately thought this person looks like he's coming he's a genie on a magic carpet because he was sitting on a Indian rug who just flew in. You never know what the Prabhupada announced after the kirtan that this process is very old, very simple and sublime and he invited everyone to participate in the easy process of the Sankirtan movement. He said, no one can check you, no one can tax you, and the result is sublime. So then, he and his disciples packed up everything and left. And then I was just standing there amidst the large crowd. A stranger invited me to walk with him to the temple, which was about a nine block walk. And then while we were uh, standing in the in the temple room, somebody offered me a chapati and while I was honoring the chapati, two um, two brahmacharis were talking that I overheard. One was telling the other, did you hear what the Swami just said? He said that when devotees have arguments, we could take it we should take it just like clouds passing by. Nobody even notices when a cloud passes by. I thought how interesting because all I ever knew was arguments. Family, society, newspapers, war in Vietnam. Then the person who walked into the temple totally disappeared and somebody else invited me up to Prabhupada's quarters. To show you what Prabhupada was dealing with in the beginning with us, I thought everything is God, so when I saw Prabhupada and the devotees bowing down on the floor, I thought, well, the floor is God too. So. <laughs> And then somebody invited me to Prabhupada's room right next to the next room from the living room. And I was thinking, I made this all up, I'm making up this person, this leader, and everybody else, it's all in my mind. Because I do have to admit I was on LSD at the time. Seeing my sad, seeing my sad state, uh, Shilla Prabhupada immediately said, this process is nothing that you made up. It's very ancient, it's sublime. Nothing that you made up or I made up. And he said, we are eternal and everything around us is temporary. What was my first brilliant question? Can I just stay high in LSD forever? He said, no, it's material and therefore it's temporary. Then he invited me to come to um, hear his classes every day. He was giving morning classes every day and evening classes three nights a week. So um, he said, uh, 
Do you live near here? So considering myself the all-pervading Godhead, Godhead, I said, yes, I live very near. He said, good, then you can come every morning to our classes. So I actually lived an hour and a half away. <laughs> with five New York trains. <laughs> but because he's such a Sankalpa, which means what he says is true, I trekked down there. <laughs> so he So just to correct one thing that Prem Prudhan said, because usually he's very sadhantic, but he said I'm Prabhupada's Kripapatra, the actual statement is, I'm waiting to become Prophet's Prophet. Okay, so that was just the introduction to show where we were starting. So first I was helping to clean the temple and um, Change the water in the flower bases. And then uh, one of his brahmacharis asked, the Swami asked, what do you do? What is your talent? So even though I was a terrible artist, because I liked it, I said, well, I guess I'm an artist. Um, so, right after that, Prabhupada invited me up to his quarters. And he, and he handed me a picture of Mahaprabhu Sankirtan party in the courtyard of Sri Vaisantra. And perhaps you've seen that original, it's published here. And so he asked me to paint that for his temple. So um, I, there was no precedent because the precedent because there weren't any other ladies. The first uh, lady had, who had joined, which is uh, John, uh, Janaki, the sister of the famous cook Jamuna, they had already gone to open the center in San Francisco. So I had no precedent for how to act or how to dress. So I went to buy all the materials for the painting, and he said I could paint in his temple room, 26 Second Avenue, famous temple. So painting there with my um, my tight dungarees and tight shirt on neck and wiping off the paint on my pants, he started painting. That's what he was dealing with. One day when I was in the middle of the painting, Shiva <laughs> Prabhupada came down to the temple room. And he looked at the painting and he could see all the great discrepancies in it. The original was far superior. And um, sometimes, you know, if you see a bunch of people, you'll see like one person's head and then another person in front of them. And then you see their feet, but it's not connected because there's the other person in front of them. So 
So I would have the head over here, the person in front of the head, and then the legs over there. So Prabhupada came into the temple room seeing that painting. And naturally, just like you've seen with Gurdi, that uh, the pure chari is like a magnet with iron filings always attached to it. So surrounded by his disciples, this is 1966. Like he looked at the painting and he said, Krishna has sent. Can you imagine? Krishna has sent. He sent me. <laughs> and then he invited me to paint up in his quarters. So his quarters is where uh, he dictated the first uh, books, BBT books, that came out and spread Krishna consciousness around the world. Like Bhagavad Gita and uh, teachings of Lord Chaitanya. So that was his room. That was also the room that he slept in. And took the shot of And then, um, and incidentally, the, the, the rugs or mats that he sat on were just second-hand things that we donated to him. He was so humble. And his desk was one of those small tin trunks that came from India. Which carried his trunk full of uh, his first canto, three volumes of Srimad Bhagavatam. Just, just a bit of diversion from the painting and his the first three volumes of his first canto. And I was still so wavering that I said, well, if I change my mind, can I give them back? He could have tried to preach to me, but because, again, he's tree color again, he knows the future, he just said yes. <laughs> so when I told him, when he invited me to come and paint in his quarters, I said, well, I'm a little worried because the paints are very toxic. And he said, it doesn't matter. So I went and started painting in his quarters. Quarters means there was his room, and then there was the middle room where um, he would offer the boga with these two belts, not one belt, but two belts, crisscross, and say the mantras for offering the boga. And where he and all of his disciples would put on tea light together by passing around the Ashtanga. And which was the first home of the uh, second Jagannath deities of this kind. The first um, Shamasundar kept in San Francisco for the very first Rathayatra, and the second Jagannath came to New York. Jagannath, 
And their first home was Prabhupada's that same room. So I sat up there, and sometimes she would Prabhupada would come in and make comments. He would sit in that typical way that Indians sit, you know, it's not quite sitting, you know, your knees are bent and not quite sitting down. Sit. Next to me and a little bit behind and they come in. Just as Krishna, um, when Putin came to kill him, he took the bright side and so, well, she's coming as mother, so I will give her the position. I will drink her milk and then I will liberate her and give her the position like a, something like a mother. So as a young 19 year old just trying to come out of hippiedom, he saw me painting and spacing out and knowing that I was thinking of a million other things. So taking the bright side, he said, yes, an artist or any intelligent person has to think more than they do. Just like when a judge hears the everybody speaking in the courtyard, then he thinks for a long time, but his judgment is just one second. Either yes or no, or go to jail, or you're afraid. And if that wasn't encouraging enough, on top of that, he told me the story of some other, some great personality who had to think before writing something. What did he tell? He told the story of Shilajaya Dev Goswami. I think everybody knows the story. Anybody not know what the story is? Well, I'll tell it in brief. That Jaya Dev Goswami was writing Gita Govinda. And uh, he was writing in trance because it was not actually his writing. And the thought that came to him, please correct me if I'm wrong, I'm always nervous to speak in front of him. So the, the words came that uh, Krishna was falling at the feet of Radharani and saying that please be merciful to me and give me the dust of your lotus feet on my head. So Jai Dev Goswami was thinking, how could she, uh, how could he bow down to her when she's his devotee and he's God? So he told his wife, but Madhati, I have to go think about this because he was traveling, his hand was traveling, his heart was traveling. So 
So he said, I'm going to take a bath in the river and I will uh, have to meditate So Padmavati saw him come back after some time. He went to his book and he wrote something. Then she saw him leave and then come back a short time later. She said, how did your hair get wet? I said, I went a long time ago to the river. She said, no, you just went. Just now, you came back and then you just went again and your hair's wet already. What do you mean I just came back? She said, you wrote something, let me see the something. He saw the verse that he couldn't complete, and he said, oh, Krishna has taken my form and he has come to complete it. Oh, Padmavati, you had the darshan of Krishna and they both fainted. So Prabhupada was taking the bright side. Then he, after that painting, he had me do the painting of Panchatattva, but now they were standing in the fire with Mahaprabhu on one side, Nityananda and Adwaita on one side, Kadara and Shivastakura. And then he wrote down on a piece of paper everybody's name that I should put uh, underneath. And just to note back, uh, he had told me, because we had this window in between his room and my, not my room, but the room I was painting in, and so sometimes he would say something to me through that uh, window, this window. So, he told me to make the Hare Krishna mantra on the bottom of the painting. But then, when I was about to do it, he said, no, never mind. Although Mahaprabhu is Krishna, he's taking the role of a devotee and he would never have a speed higher than the name. Yeah, so in this Panchatattva one, he wrote down everybody's name, Garanga, Nityananda, so on. And then he had Gargamoni, who was the first Iskan um, treasurer, hang the painting on the wall. And then when it was on the wall, he made an announcement in his class. Now Lord Chaitanya is here. Now there should be no nonsense in the temple. Lord Chaitanya is here, his expansion, his incarnation, his uh, energy, his pure devotees. <laughs> and just to show how, uh, again, the A and the B, and if you, so if you just chant Hare Krishna in front of this painting, you can all be fully Krishna conscious. I think I need to um, escalate the speed. How much time do I have? 
So, um, huh? yes. she always quotes what Gurdjieff told me. Uh, when Gurdjieff would call on me to speak, and I'd start speaking, he'd look at me and say, Be brief. <laughs> So then uh, he gave me a photograph of his Guru Maharaj, what he said on the source, what he told us. <coughs> and he probably personally taught me the great system, you know the great system? You make, like, here's the picture, so you put a piece of acetate over it, and then you make a, um, what do you call it? And then you do the same thing on the big canvas, and just copy one box at a time. So then the painting started being done by that. So my custom was that when I'd leave at night and could then go all the way home to the Bronx and then come back, um, I would just leave the painting on the floor. So when I came back one morning, I found the painting on a pillow. He was showing me by his own example how to be respectful. And how the picture is the person when, um, when it's authorized. For a moment, on that note, I'll jump a few years to 1972. Just to mention that he wrote me in a letter. We don't want to throw the pictures of Krishna and his associates this way and that way. Because, because in the spiritual world, both the picture, both the person and the picture are real. Whereas in the material world, both the picture and the person are not real. I'm sorry that one thing always reminds me of another. I'll for one second jump to 1993. <laughs> when about five of us were standing around Chula Gurdi. And he said, you're not seeing me. So back to back his Guru Maharaj. When I finished that picture, he made a big announcement in front of his all who were in the room. You have brought me by Kunta. This is the humble Acharya, who sees all good in others. He's a dosha darshi, doesn't see the faults. Later on, he had me do a painting of, this is about a year later, a painting of the Madanlo Hunt Temple, which you might have already visited or tried here. It was a black and white photo that he gave me. He was in the hospital, suffering from a so-called heart attack, and this is uh, Illness pastimes, 68. He said it was a red sandstone, make it reddish. And then when I completed that, that was the time that he was going to go 
back to India, ostensibly for his health, but actually to bring his message to people in India who didn't have it. And he was going to the Radha Damodar temple in that whole area in Vrindavan. Again, encouraging us uh, regarding the paintings, the importance of the paintings. He said, so I'll be on one side of the world and you'll be on another side. But just meditate on the painting and we'll be packed up tight. And just chant Hare Krishna and we'll be packed up tight. Then he had me paint a picture of, uh, gave me a small photo, he invited me up to his quarters. He went to his, that metal Elmira that you see here, the gray that jingles when you try to open it. And uh, he pulled out a picture of Mother Yusota feeding Krishna. And he made everything very simple for me because I was new. And he said, she's so advanced that Krishna accepted her as his mother. Even though my, uh, you know, it's really amazing when I look back because he could have just had a large photograph made of the original picture and had that on, but to engage us, so many artists in his service, he engaged us in that way. And when that painting was on the wall, he motioned to it in his class. And he said, we don't want to, because he would talk a lot about Mayavadis and so many fantastic analogies and evidences to uh, destroy the, the um, misunderstandings near Vasheshish and your body question to the Shatarni. So looking at the, pointing to the picture, he said, we don't want to become one with Krishna. We want to become better, greater than Krishna, just like Mother Yasoda, who thought, if I don't feed him, he'll die. I won't go into his arguments, because that will take more time, I'll just go into one. Like he would say in his morning classes, as half of his disciples would have these like gray woolen tents over them, like just blankets, but they'd make the tents, they were under these tents, and everybody would be looking at everybody else, and he would just go on speaking, and he was being because he knew he was being recorded by this giant reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and ultimately his message would get all over the world. So, um, he'd say the Mayavadis say it's just like when a water pot is filling up, it makes a sound going, and then when it's full, then it's silent. So when someone is in illusion or even trying for spiritual life, they may have so much to talk about. But when one 
realizes himself and he becomes silent. Like he becomes a silent god. So, so Prabhupada's argument is, if you're giving an analogy, you have to have many similar points. I see no similar points here because can the living entity be compared with a water pump? And then one day he, he uh, brought me to his cover of Srimad Bhagavatam and he said, I just want you to paint that little area in the middle of Radha and Krishna. And that picture, because it was printed in India in the olden days, you know when, when the colors are off register? So that's how the whole thing was. It was hard to tell what was happening. I mean, this may sound ridiculous, but I didn't know what a garland was in those days, so I made it like a candy cane kind of thing around it. <laughs> and whenever he would come into the temple, he would always bow down to that painting and then climb up to his Yasa Sana. <laughs> And just to show up again and again and again how encouraging he was, um, he was giving an analogy of how Krishna is like the sun on Purnamaya Purnamida because uh, the example in the uh, uh, Ishopada side is that he's the complete whole and even though so many complete units emanate from him like this phenomenal cosmic manifestation, still he remains the and he gave the analogy of the sun. Since the beginning of time, the sun has been emanating so much heat and light that it never got cold. And here's where the encouragement came. He said, just like Jadarani is making so many pictures of Krishna, but she, but she doesn't become less. <laughs> and then he, uh, he had me make 24 Vishnus. You know, there's 24. Vishnu is in the causal ocean, you know that the one that you might have seen on the cover of uh, Sopanishad. And then he wrote on a piece of paper in a Sanskrit uh, letters um, the name of that uh, Vishnu incarnation and the um, yeah, the name of the Vishnu. In English letters and in um, So that was the introduction because they're not all, all the incarnations are not in the causal ocean. Just to bring us in gradually to the touch for like just write a student. And then in 1968, when we, some of us moved to start the temple in Boston, Massachusetts. And I was still working on the 24 Vishnu <laughs> manifestations. <laughs> And I wrote him and I said, I thought these Vishnu incarnations are in Vakunta. And he wrote back that Krishna is everywhere, Vishnu is everywhere. Yeah. 
which reminds me, if we can jump to 2012 for a moment. There were, did you ever hear the stories of how when I spoke with Shua Bhakti to Gambar, he was so much about the apparent difference in the instructions that I got from Carl Tiger regarding the art? Yes, no? We no. Okay. You became such a great part of the ad, so amazing. <laughs> Or even later, when painting for Prabhupada's books, and uh, the subject of the paintings would be whatever was written in Prabhupada's manuscript. Because my training was not training, but all I saw was the Indian print. And so I painted everybody with peacock feathers. <laughs> and Prabhupada never corrected me. <laughs> he did correct me after some years about the long afro hair that I was giving Krishna. <laughs> Fargard was always the best of the painters, uh, so we tried And he made Krishna with his long, out, outcoming hair, and so we just followed him. Even though, uh, even though the Indian prince had, you know, the beautiful, short, hair, wavy hairstyle. Uh, so, Prabhupada didn't say anything. He was just writing us letters, like when we did the Bhagavad Gita paintings. He would write to us that you have all my blessings and all your God brothers' congratulations. The paintings are beautiful. <laughs> And when the when the, when we were doing the Krishna book paintings in 1971, 70-71, um, he had already created a um, an assembly line process where one person would do the sketch, the color sketch, put it on the canvas, then I would develop it, and then somebody else would Bardash would start, then I would do the middle, and Burley Dorn would put on the details like nails and jewelry. Um, yeah. He ordered that the paintings come out every two days, two days, two days, two days. So that even though each painting took six days, two, every two days a new painting would come out. Because he was in a mad rush to get his books out before he would leave. A reporter once asked him, what will happen when you leave? And he said, when you die, he said, I'll never die. I will live forever in my books. But anyway, he was in a major hurry to get his books out. He 
with the BBT, which was at that time called ISKCON Press, on a very mad schedule as well. In those days, there was no computer. There was a composer, which is like halfway between a typewriter and a computer. And he had his disciples on a 24-hour schedule. Half the day was one, and half the day was another. In this way, so many books came out so quickly. And during that, he kept encouraging us. When the Krishna book was first printed, he had he himself went to Japan to print and then he would write to us artists that um, 25 advanced copies were printed and immediately 23 were sold. It is simply to the pictures. He said the pictures make the text more clear. Just like if you have a description of a man walking, and then you see a picture of a man walking, that makes it more clear. And even though we would complain to each other that our pictures uh, are not good enough for Prabhupada's very high, not Prabhupada, it's the Krishnadas Kamaraj or Yasdev Sukadeva Goswami with Prabhupada's purports and translation. But it was so amazing and sadhantic and rustic that what are these pictures that we're doing? They're so childish. So we wrote to him and asked if it's okay for us to um, go to some kind of school and study from the old masters who were so experts. And he was in such a hurry that he said that um, if somebody's house, you're like your next door neighbor, if his house is on fire, but he doesn't speak English, he doesn't speak your language, and then you take the time to learn his language, <laughs> or if your house is on fire and you need to tell people and you don't know their language, and you, you want to take the time to learn their language so that they can help you, in the meantime, everything burns down. And then in that same letter he wrote, um, the teacher is not so concerned how the student is doing the homework as that student is doing the homework. So painting will be your own training. Just paint and Krishna will give you whatever talent you already have and Krishna will give you more intelligence. But then in 1974, all the bricks came down. All the bricks from Prabhupada came tumbling on our head. And he started um, saying how you make Krishna with long, wild hair just like a hippie. And that's because of your hippie mentality. I don't know if you're familiar with 
with the Krishna book. Like I'm always curious about the Krishna book. There's a painting by um, my god sister Devahuti. She, she just copied an Indian print. It's kind of childlike, but it's very dainty and nice. And Krishna had that nice, you know, shortish way to hear. And uh, that went in his first Krishna book. And then I thought, well, I'll make it for his third canto where there's another reference to the Rasa Lila. I'll make it much more realistic. So I invited about 10 devotees to come to the park and pose in their uh, you know, words. So we'd have the forest scene and then have them posing. And because it said in the Krishna book, and it also said in the Nectar of Devotion, that Krishna's hair looked like he was being embraced by the goddess of fortune. So we figured, okay, it's so long. And um, when Krishna was dancing with the gopis in the Rasa Lila, their hair became loose and their clothes became loose, so that's what I did. And uh, that went in the third canto when Prabhupada wrote that you've ruined my book. <laughs> <laughs> and for the next um, for the next printing of the Krishna book, again we wanted to make this is all around the same time, so we haven't been smashed yet. So <laughs> In fact, this exact incident was the precursor to that because, again, we were thinking that let's have more technically good paintings. So we wanted to substitute all the Krishna, the old Krishna book paintings, uh, for new, better technical ones. And Prabhupada had already had the original Krishna book paintings on his wall. Perhaps you've seen his quarters in Los Angeles. He would have the pictures on his walls and he would offer flowers to them as well. And so we didn't have anyone see it in Los Angeles. And the pictures we wanted to um, replace them with weren't the exact pastimes, they were more general pictures of Krishna. So we didn't have the same pastimes. At that time, Prabhupada was so angry. Brahmaswar was writing us a letter because he was showing Prabhupada the pictures he wanted to replace with what we wanted to replace it with. He said the other few devotees in the room were trembling in the corner and Prabhupada's hand was shaking with his angry voice that you could hear across the street. Like we had done in the Krishna book, a picture of Vasudeva carrying Krishna, baby Krishna, across the river to give Krishna to Mother Yasoda, who already had the full Krishna. But we, but we didn't put, we had the jackal there showing that he could go through that uh, river, even though it was raging, 
that you want to make a path for him. But we didn't put Shesha acting, you know, the million-headed serpent, like an umbrella over his head to shield the So we wanted to replace that with a technically better picture, but it wasn't the pastime. So when Ramasor presented him with that, he said, so just put Shesha over the picture that was already there. And when Ramasor said, we can't do that now, he said, then leave the picture as it is. He said, your disease is changing. Um, 11 years later, uh, 12 years later, in 1976 or 7, when we were doing the first, can first volume of the 10th canto, when Prabhupada was dictating the 10th canto, we made better versions of the same paintings, same pastime, and those were all accepted. I like that. So not only, not only was Prophet accepted the peacock feathers, uh, but he also, even though it's said in his nectar of devotion that Madhya Soda is the color of a blue lotus flower, he still had us admit, he had us make her golden. So these were two different things from Shilagurdi. Because Gurudev always explained why uh, Krishna is blue because Mother is blue. His father is fair, but Mother Yasoda is blue. And there are so many references in Shastra, even Prabhupada's books as well, where Mother Yasoda is blue. Um, so, and then he would always make the distinction that only Krishna in Vrindavan has a peacock feather. And Krishna left the peacock feather with Mother Yusoda in Vrindavan when he went to other places. There's no need for the peacock feather except to attract the gopis for dancing with him, reminding them of the peacock. And besides, the peacock feather has the name Radha on it. When Gurdjieff was telling us that in 1999, I believe it was in Italy, I was sitting in the front row, you know, ladies on one side and on the other side. And I said, I don't see it. So he put the peacock feather closer to me and he said, you don't see it? I just want to interrupt myself a second to ask you, am I making any sense because I'm going... So, when we were using, we got, uh, we did, had a contract with the BBT that I can use my BBT paintings in any way that I want. So, for the GBP, for these books or any other thing. So, when I was using Prabhupada's, the paintings that I had done for Prabhupada in Gurudev's books, 
I always changed the muddy soda to blue by you know computer graphics, and we took off the peacock feathers. <laughs> But then Gurdiv gave me the order to, he said, just like ISKCON has a big coffee table, big coffee table art books, I want you to make a big book like that with all the pictures that you did for Prabhupada and me. Well, I never took him too seriously. He ordered me four times. One time we were showing him the half-finished bus reliefs that uh, were done under his direction, you know, in the Govardhan temple. And again he ordered that we do the art book. And he said, you know, there's an artist in Vrindavan named Kanai, and he got an award from the president of India. So, um, I want you to make this art book and then show one, um, show one copy to the president of India. If he gave an award to the, um, to the, this Kanai, what will he do when he sees your Well, now I'm remembering that I told this exact same story the last time I was here, years ago. Yes, I did because she was translated. We had the same translation. Oh, yeah, so I, right. I know, so, so it's okay. <laughs> the reason that I remember that I told the same story is because she was translating, and when I gave Srila Bharti Maharaj's, um, what do you call it, reconciliation, she started crying. I thought, oh, she's so advanced. <laughs> She had tears in her eyes. Did you say that? <laughs> so, um, yes, there are many different people here today. So, the first is a bottle, if they don't like it. So, um, right, so then, because I didn't take him seriously, yes, while, um, while Gurdjieff was physically present, yes, I didn't think it was an important instruction, because why would I want to just show off my paintings? In fact, one time, um, I asked him, why do you want me to make this art book? Because I had so many doubts. So he said, um, so that people could see what a good artist you are. Starting the conversation, he was kind of lying on his bed at Govardhan, and then when I said that, he sat up straight and said, "Then don't do it." I said, "Okay, I'll do it." So then, uh, I didn't do it during his physical presence because he always gave us, um, 
things to finish up until the end. I mean, we had work for his books. <laughs> And up until the moment that he was, that he entered uh, Nichilila, or you could say he hid from our view, but he's still here, um, I was engaged in uh, editing and publishing his books as well, so I didn't do the art book during his physical presence. All right, so then I was stuck because I couldn't ask him any further questions about how to do it. As you may know, uh, Chula Gurdjieff nicknamed me Question Ronnie because I always had millions of questions. <laughs> Once he said to me, oh, you're made of questions, your body is made of questions. So I replied, well, fortunately I found somebody who's made of answers. <laughs> but anyway, now I couldn't ask him, and I was in a dilemma, because when I was using Shula Prabhupada's paintings in Gurudev's books, you know, we touch things up, but now if they're both going to be in the same book, which, what should I do and who should I follow? So then, uh, on October 6, 2012, I was just beginning to come to see Shula Bharati Maharaj. I don't know if any of you were, were you at the Vera Hamahotsuma yesterday? Were any of you there? Some were there. So that was at the Vinodvani Gaudiyamai. So that's where we had this conversation. So I told them what the problem was. I said, I don't know who's right. I'm, they're both pure devotees. I don't know what to do. So in a nutshell, he said that Srila Prabhupada was right by saying, by not correcting the peacock feathers, and Srila Gurudev was right in owning Krishna and having the peacock feather in Vrindavan. Number one, Prabhupada's consideration was on Tattva Vichar, that by Tattva, all the incarnations of Krishna are not different from him. And how would you describe Tattva as philosophical truth, fundamental philosophical truth? And Srila Gurudev's consideration was on the basis of Rasa Vichar, for the consideration of pastimes. So, by pastimes, only, only Krishna and Vrindavan has the peacock feather. Is that an okay way to do Rasa Vichar? That Vichar means metaphysical principles. Okay. And the uh, Rasa Vichar is aesthetic principles. Okay. It always speaks very So, K 
Kesha Madrita Narahari Rupa. By Tattva, by philosophy, by what was the word you used? Metaphysical understanding. All of the incarnations are Keshava, having assumed that form. There is no one but Krishna, Krishna and Vrindavan, who has fine curly hair. Another thing is that he said that when a child, a student, is in a certain grade, he learns one thing, and having become situated in that, then he could learn another thing. Like for example, first he'll learn that, he said, first he'll learn that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and then later on he'll learn the sun is always there. Or, mother, where is the moon? Just look over there. You see, you see that tree? Well, see that light ball sitting on the tree? That, there's the moon. Chandra Sakanyai, the logic of the moon on the branch. First you give the student something very simple to understand, and then when he becomes grounded and more advanced, then you can give a higher understanding. Okay, so that was clear. So what, what about Mother Yasoda? Um, so he said, the pure devotee may speak according to its moods, which is according to what uh, leelas are coming into his heart. Just like our Paramburde, uh, he made white Krishna when everybody else in the Gaudiya Mount was making black Krishna. And that was because he's seeing the Leela of Krishna feeling separation from Radharani and turning golden. And then, or, Krishna embracing Radharani after the separation is over and they meet again. Um, no, not, not that one, just the other one. That was the verse. Sorry. So, because Krishna's feeling separation from Radharani, he's got golden. Although by fact, Mother Yusod is actually Jewish. So I said, well, okay, so what, what was Prabhupada thinking, what was going on in his heart that he said to make um, Mother Yusod golden? So he said, Mother Yusod is waiting for Radharani to come every morning to cook. And when she's late, she becomes so absorbed in anxiety, thinking of Radharani, when will she come? When, she, when will she come? She's going out of her house to look on the road, coming back, going out again. That in her absorption, she becomes golden. There are millions of more things to say about Prabhupada and Gurudev in relation to the art. 
but I think I've already overloaded you. So. Крам means step by step. 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 Step
Oh, yeah. Actually, that fits with the crop. <laughs> I kept wanting to go back to the Here's another replacement um, fiasco. <laughs> so in 1968, Shilla gave me, I mean, he actually just ripped a book. An Indian book with pictures in it. And it gave me a picture of Narada Muni. In one hand holding a um, vena and one hand holding the clappers, you know, the clappers that jingle. It makes a click click sound. With the wood. And inside the wood is these little like baby cartels and they jingle at the same time. So, um, so I just copied that picture. And in fact, um, Bharadraj and Murlidhar came later when we were doing the Krishna book together and they helped to complete it and make it even more beautiful. But still following the picture that Prabhupada gave me. And it was big, it's about three by five feet. And you probably you probably saw that in the Krishna book. So I complained to Prabhupada when he came to Boston in 1969. I said it took so long. And he was very encouraging. He said, unless you spend some time, how can you expect something first class? Class because he had an English Indian accent. On one hand, he was encouraging about taking more time. On the other hand, there were so many letters which I can tell you about next time of how he wanted one picture to come out a day. So that one that he said it's okay that it took so long, um, that was for the Krishna book and that was big, but the very first one that I did was just about that size and it was pretty much exactly the way it was in the book. And Prabhupada had that put on his wall of the second Iskand temple was which was about eight blocks away from the first, 61 Second Avenue. It was a little bigger than the first. Um, so after I did the first and second painting, then I went to Boston and I began to think, well, no, actually I was in New York. I was in Boston, but I was visiting New York, and at that time they had the Mona Lisa exhibited in the big, uh, like, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And everybody would only get a moment's view, like you see at Bucky the Hardy. And there were, there were like two, two blocks of lines waiting to see this famous painting. So I thought, well, I want the paintings that you would probably to be so famous. So I went to the library to look for more 
realistic models of Narada Muni in the background. So then I did a more muscular, uh, more by my conception realistic uh, body of Narada Muni. With a more realistic Lord Jesus type Jody that you might see it starts there in the And in a realistic American Redwood Forest. So, then I sent that more realistic version to San Francisco because Prabhupada had me send whatever painting that I did, he wanted me to make copies for as many temples as he had. So he temples that And the devotees hung it on the wall and they wrote me a letter. We've never had such an ecstatic kirtan as now in front of Narada Muni. <laughs> you can imagine, since I'm not only made of questions but also false ego, how happy I was. <laughs> And then, as fate, as fate would have it, Prabhupada went to San Francisco. And he wrote me that the first painting that he did of Narada Muni, he looked like a first class brahmachari. And this new painting that you did, he looks like a manager. Milk drinkers have full smooth skin and sweet red lips, and meters have broad cheeks and muscles. Um, then he had Govinda Dasi, who was his kind of servant secretary, send me one of those little Brajbasi prints of Suridas, you know, that blind singer, and little like six year old Krishna sitting and listening. And Krishna's looking really like kind of sweetly plump and uh, so then I you know what's the opposite side of false ego? When it's pleased, you know, you get so elated. And when it's crushed, you want to commit suicide, so that's how I was then. So I wrote Prabhupada a three-line letter of apology. So then he wrote back that this is the first time I've received a letter from you with only three lines. He said not to be depressed. He said the thing is, uh, it takes a long time to become a famous artist because that was my original and in the meantime you lose your Krishna consciousness he said don't paint to please the senses of the general public they are rascals 
жулики, потому что они все негодяи. Hey, Gazata. Hey, Gazata, say you go. Gazai. Hey, to please the senses of our charities. Рисуй, что услужить, порадовать наши начальники, чтобы их угодить. And if nobody wants to buy them, I don't mind. We can sell them to the devotees in all of our temples. И не важно, если никто не захочет покупать твои картины, наши предные с удовольствием будут раскупить для того, как их надо. There's a story you said in that letter of a um, Brahmin who was um, walking through a foreign land, forests and places far away from his home. And uh, I forget whether he was a Hindu or a Brahmin Hindu, but um, he got very hungry. So the first person's house that he went to, he was like a Muslim or somebody out of caste. He was supposed to eat in the house of a, yeah. like a Hindu or a Brahmin. And a Hindu could eat in the house of a, a Hindu. So, okay, so he's a Brahmin, he could only eat in the house of a Brahmin. He could only eat in the house of a Brahmin. But he was so hungry, he couldn't help it. So, unfortunately, that person that fed him um, didn't have enough for him to eat. So after he left, and he kept wandering, he lamented that I lost my cast and still I'm hungry. I didn't so then, because Prabhupada didn't have so many temples then, then he came to New York later. And like he continued, I was in his room and he continued his letter. And I continued apologizing. He said, really, it's not a matter of um, a painting being good. It's by karma somebody becomes famous, and then people think, oh, so and so painted that? Then it's about to be good. Let's go see it. Like Picasso, it's a Picasso. Let's go see it. So I said, well, you know, meanwhile, so he's sitting there and I'm sitting there, and there's his little tin trunk. So, like we were leaning on the trunk, and he said, "Well, I said, well, we do that too. We say, oh, Prabhupada said that, then it must be good." And then he said, nonetheless, he is. He said, of course, that is love. That is a different thing. Just like a mother has a child who's blind, and out of love, she calls the child Padmalocha. <laughs> then he said, that wasn't enough. He said, I like your eyes. Um, Cat sides. Everyone likes cat sides, don't you? I, I can't. As I'm repeating this, I can't really believe that it happened, but it happened. <laughs> so then I said, I like your eyes, lotus eyes. He said, he likes my eyes, cat eyes. Everybody likes cat eyes. So then, he back and said, so then he pulled himself back and he said, I'm an old fool. I'm an old fool. So I guess we'll end for today. Oh, uh, unless there's one last question.
What's your name? I know I know it. Я хотел бы все-таки узнать, вы не сдали эту книгу или нет? Most of the descriptions from their respective books, but now we're working on the um, front matter material of, like our articles. So that should take another year or year and a half. That reminds me of another. Well, this one is an art, but. It's um, just the fact of taking so long after the Guru's order. Um, Prabhupada, um, I'm sorry, Gurudev uh, called on me to talk about how he calls on different people uh, to talk about different subjects that he's, that's his theme and his Harikata. So in Badger, he called on me to talk about the evidences that, um, what was it, that we didn't call him by Kanta? that we came from the Vitasta region. So while I was standing there giving my converted reflection of what Prem Priyodhya would have explained, <laughs> Um, he said, I want you to make two books, one of, uh, to prove that we came from the Tesla region, and the other one was uh, to prove that Prabhupada is uh, in Madhuri Bhav. <laughs> And then, as uh, you know, Prof. Gurde would speak on every Prabhupada's sannyas day, and so and he would always announce that that uh, Shamarani has been given so many evidences from Prabhupada's own words that, uh, in fact, uh, we didn't fall from Vaikuntha. So then 2010 rolls along and we're here with her date in South Africa. We were in Durban and uh, it was a darshan and I said, you know, Gurde, we're almost ready to publish the book. He gave it the name Journey of the Soul, that was his name. I just have one more question. He said, you haven't printed yet? It's six years after the instructions. You know, like what he kept saying, and Shamarani has given so many evidences. So I said, no, but we just have one more question and we're almost ready to print. So his comment on my uh, Guru Seva was, oh my God. <laughs> So I'll end there, I'll end there, so you can see where I'm at in my work <laughs> Go, 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 Go,